Welcome to Topper Talk, your number one Western Kentucky athletics podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Moffitt, and I'm joined by co-host Tyler Bailey. Hilltopper Nation, whether it's happening on the hill or on the road, grab those red towels, stand up and cheer, because it's up next on Topper Talk. Welcome back, and thank you for downloading and listening to another episode of the Topper Talk podcast. As always, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, we're topper underscore talk at all those uh, head over to our YouTube channel at topper talk podcast. Give us a follow over there. Uh, share the episodes as always, you'll know, spread the word. We'd love, you know, any assistance with that. Give us some feedback on those episodes. Um, we're also now on Facebook, you know, head over there. Give us a follow as well. As always, I've got my man Tyler here with me. We've got a big episode to jump into Tyler. You ready? Yeah, man, it's felt like forever since we've done one, so I'm ready to get this thing cooking, boy. Before we do that, let's talk about our sponsor, and that is the Fireman Moving Company. They are the official moving company of WKU Athletics. Not only can they be trusted to move all the coaches in and out of Western, but they can move you anywhere nationwide. The Fireman Moving Company is owned and operated by Firemen and is founded by WK alumni. If you are looking to move sometime soon, give them a call at 270 791 1755 and get yourself a free quote i promise you it will be the best thing that you do for any move that you have um big or small near or far they will make your life a whole lot easier um they're fairly priced they're efficient they're good at what they do so let the professionals do it now before we jump into our main segment of the episode which is recapping some basketball games and previewing the upcoming games this week let's jump into our red towel wrap up which catches us up with all the athletics we've missed in the last week so tyler hit us with that red towel wrap up all right so it's going to be kind of a long one uh on the 25th wku women's basketball played uh, fiu and lost 60 to 70 wku track and field competed in the lenny lyle's invitational in louisville kentucky they also uh, the meet also featured Ohio State, Purdue, Memphis, and host Louisville. Eight Hilltoppers finished day one in the top ten in their events, highlighted by freshman Natanya Lenars finishing third in the 60-meter hurdles. Junior Ayla Basic finished sixth in the women's weight throw. Amelia Lesniak cleared 1.78 meters in the high jump and is ranked 34th in the NCAA, which is awesome. Uh, sophomore Riley Evans set a personal record by 35 seconds in the 3,000-meter race. Freshman Bernal Desinor finished second in the men's 200 meter. On day two, Lucy Rutherford finished ninth in the 5,000 meter race, and Wade Balcom set a season best time with four minute 23 second mile. Full results of the meet can be found on wkusports.com. On the 20 on the 26th, tennis hosted North uh, Northern Kentucky University and swept them seven zip. On the 28th, uh, tennis hosted Western Carolina and lost 4-3. to three. Full results of those tennis matches can also be found on WKUSports.com. WKU football's got some news. They announced the signing of nine new players, quarterback T.J. Finley, running back Taryn uh, Keith, wide receiver Keyshawn Johnson, offensive line Stacey Wilkins, uh, safety Kent Robinson, defensive line Jaleel Riviera Harvey, cornerback Jameer Mundy, Defensive back, DeMarco Williams, and safety, Tate Titchell. Uh, Quantavius Leslie was announced as withdrawn from the transfer portal. And Johnny Bench was on hand for the baseball first pitch event. Pretty cool guest to have speak. You know, I mean, it's not like he is known for anything. Uh, t- season tickets are on sale for WK softball and baseball less than three weeks from opening day. Malachi Corley is practicing for the senior bowl and Austin Reed for the shrine bowl. Both getting major love from the media. All sessions, all session passes are now on sale for the CUSA basketball championship in Huntsville. CUSA football conference scheduled for 2024 are dropping on Thursday at noon. And this is something to interest uh, some people out there. WKU football walk-on tryouts are Monday, February 12th at 7 a.m. at the Houch with required interest meeting Wednesday, uh, January 31st at 6 p.m. And I've got to say, I'm a few few years graduated, but uh, I'm going to see if I still got some uh, eligibility left. That's it for the Red Tower Wrap-Up. Moff, back to you. Yeah, a lot of good stuff in there. I mean, sports are, they're ramped up. I mean, track and field, uh, tennis going, basketball, obviously. 
Um, all the football signings, some of those we had talked about when they committed, um, but they were officially announced as signees. Um, then obviously the, you know, football or softball and baseball will be firing up real soon. That first pitch event with Johnny Bench was really cool to have someone, you know, a Hall of Famer, just an all-time guy here to speak to our team and fans. Um, you know, the Malachi Corley and Austin Reed preparing for those uh, postseason games those all-star events. Uh, we've shared a lot of content of, of how they're doing and getting a lot of love uh, from media types, you know, NFL draft guru people that are saying, you know, those guys are shooting up boards, making themselves some money. Um, the Conference USA Championship uh, all-session passes on sale. Again, that's in Huntsville, Alabama this year. Um, a lot more travel friendly for our fans. Um, so hoping to see a, a good big contingent of red down there. I know I'll, I'll plan in on being there unless something comes up. Can't wait to be there. <clears throat> but now let's jump into the main segment of the episode, and that is recapping our game last week versus FIU. We hosted FIU in front of 4,144 fans in what was the coaches versus cancer pink out, and we came out with an impressive 105-91 to 91 victory. The win moves WKU to 14 and 6 on the season and 3 and 3 in conference, while FIU drops to 7 and 13 on the season and 2 and 4 in conference play. Now this game went into half with WKU holding a narrow 49 to 46 lead, but in the second half we were able to pull away with a convincing victory, uh really, you know, primarily on the back of a magnificent performance from Dante Allen. Both of us uh, saw this game as a potential high-scoring game. But I don't think either of us expected it to be, you know, ninety to hundred high. So Tyler, you know, looking back at this game, how, you know, how did it feel and play out to you? Well, you know, it it was a great offensive output from from uh, from the Hilltoppers. You know, all but one person that played scored, and that being Jack. Uh, you know, he 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 didn't score, but you know, everyone else um, was able to get buckets. Uh, you know, it's, it's capping off by Dante Allen. He scored 30 in 33 minutes of play, nine of, nine of 11 from the field, five of seven from three-pointers, and a perfect seven to seven from the charity strike. Uh, you know, Don McHenry, he was chipping in there, 17 points in 26 minutes of play, seven to 10 shooting from the field, one one of two from three-point, and uh, two of two from the free-throw line. He also had five assists. Um, sadly, he did have five turnovers, but – you know, I mean, what what we have this this game? Twenty turnovers uh, total. Uh, yeah, twenty to their sixteen. Um, I mean, and I saw after the game uh, that we were ranked number one in the nation in adjusted tempo with seventy five point eight possessions per forty minutes, and that's Perk and Palm. So we, you know, we were earlier in the season we were like ranked number two. We moved up, so we're playing faster. So I guess with that turnovers do happen um you know brandon newman and rodney howard both came up just short of a of a double double with newman having 15 points and eight rebounds and Howard uh howard having 12 points and eight rebounds um you know you're right i did not think this was going to be uh, such a high scoring game you know i think i was i think we had it i had it in the 70s for both teams um but dang um I mean, this this game was this game was one for the fans that showed up, uh, you know, for pretty much the pink out, which I think is a great, uh, you know, a great cause for for the coaches versus cancer. So I'm not mad at the team. I I think there towards the end, our defense kind of laxed up just a little bit, um, and FIU is able to score some points, but at the end of the day, wins win, no matter how ugly, no matter how pretty. Uh, it still goes in right in the left hand column instead of the right, so that's something we can be thankful for. But uh, no, I, I I think this was a great game. Yeah, I would say that this was probably easily our best offensive performance of the season. Um, you know, just had a lot of guys that chipped in double figures. You mentioned you know several of them: Dante there, Don, Brandon, uh, Rodney Howard had twelve points, eight rebounds. Tyrone Marshall had ten points, five assists. And just a couple of huge highlight dunks. Um, you know, really just a great offensive performance and something that if we can continue to build on um, and continue to be that efficient from the field, you know, we shot over 60% for the game um, and 50% from three. While not, you know, we didn't shoot a ton of them, 
Uh, but we took good shots and rhythm in the flow of the offense and and made you know over 50 percent of them so that's going to be uh very helpful to when you're not forcing shots um have a higher chance of them going in so let's look at some of the uh, key indicators for this game before we jump into grades like i just said wk shot a blistering 65 percent from the field fiu only shot 40.5 percent we shot 58.8 percent from three we were 10 out of 17 well, FIU shot a respectable 42.5%. They were 17 out of 40. They took 40 three-pointers out of their 74 total shots. So more than half their shots were threes. Um, but they were playing from behind. They're trying to catch up, you know, that second half. Uh, we out-rebounded them. We had 37 rebounds to only 31 for FIU. And then, like you said, we had 20 turnovers while FIU had 16. So, we had 60 shot attempts on the game, and we, you know, had with 20 turnovers, you're looking at, you know, quick math. We missed out on an additional potential 20 shots, so 25% of our possessions we turned the ball over. You know, you you mentioned the uh, the fastest pace offense, 75 uh, possessions per game. We we would have had 80 possessions this game, or that many shot attempts. We only had 60 shot attempts and still put up 105 points. So. When we were shooting, not turning the ball over, we were efficient. You know, we we were very effective on that end of the the court when we weren't turning the ball over. Now, obviously, we gave up ninety one points. Um, you know, that's something we can uh, fix later down the road. But when you score one hundred and five, you're going to be okay. So let's jump into some grades for this FIU game, Tyler. What about the offense? All right. So on the offense, we had five players scoring in double figures uh, and. Um, I saw this. We scored 75 points out of our 105 from inside the paint or from the free throw line. So, you know, you're getting them high percentage shots like that. It, it's going to end up being pretty good. Uh, also, we had uh, 22 assists, 20 turnovers. The only thing that's really hard in this grade is the turnovers. But, I mean, with 105 points and, you know, a great offensive team effort, I'm going to give this one a A-. minus. Yeah, I'm right there with you. The uh, the turnovers are, again, you know, it's been a key point for us, uh, a key to victory is, you know, minimize the turnovers, take better care of the ball, get it down closer to 10 to 12, you know, 14 maybe we could live with. Um, you know, 20 is a big number. We were still able to get a, a nice convincing win, but I'm going to give the offense an A- minus as well. What about the defense in this game? Uh, you know, this was a fast pace, fast pace game. And, uh, you know, at halftime wins 49 to 46, um, you know, defense, maybe not there. Um, you know, thankfully they only hit 17 of their 40. Um, and they only scored 26 points in the paint, 21 points off turnovers. And we had nine steals and forced FIU into 16 turnovers. Um, you know, I'm going to give the defense a B on this one. But yeah, again, I'm right there with you. I mean, giving up 91 points is concerning. Um, you know, a lot of that is when you turn the ball over 20 times, it's going the other way. Uh, before you can set your defense up, that doesn't help. Um, FIU does play, um, you know, a hectic defensive style themselves. They were full court the whole game, so speeding us up, causing some of those turnovers. Um, but we did give up 91 points as well over our season average. Um, but obviously it was enough to win this ball game. So I'm going to give them a B as well. What about coaching versus FIU? Well, I think the coaches came in with a good game plan. Uh, you know, he, the, <clears throat> the nine players uh, had had playing time. Uh, you know, I mean, there's nothing I can really fault, uh, fault the coaches for, so I'm going to give them an A as well. Yeah, I'm going with an A. I mean, they um... – were very effective. You know, they knew what FIU was going to bring to the table as far as the the defensive pressure. Um, you know, for the most part, we broke that pressure um, with good relief help in the backcourt. A lot of our turnovers were just um, carelessness, not necessarily their pressure or, or um, just us, you know, unforced turning the ball over, throwing it out of bounds. You know, just stuff that we can clean up on paper. Um, so I think coaching had a great game plan. Um, you know, they, they've obviously put us in better position offensively where, you know, I think this is three games now in a row where we've shot over 50% from the field. Um, so that's going to win you a lot of ball games as well. So coaching, you know, I'm giving Steve Lutz and staff, they're getting an A for me. Uh, what about the crowd? We had a good 4,144 people there, pink out. 
what do you give the crowd? Yeah, I, I, I saw it. You know, uh, 4,100, 44, 40, 4,144 people cheering on the tops. And they raised, they did raise $4,200 for the American Cancer Society, uh, which, uh, like I said earlier, I'm really glad that the Hilltopper, Hilltopper Nation could do that. Um, you know, I, I do wish more people would have showed up, but, you know, sometimes some things can't be helped. Um, so I'm going and I, I'm going to give the fans an A plus on this one. I'm I'm proud of Hilltopper Nation coming out for a great cause, having a pink out. Um, you know, just just go tops. I want more. I, I want I want five thousand plus. I want six thousand plus. I think, you know, this team. Uh, you know, they've they've put together some wins. They've had some disappointing losses. Don't get me wrong, but they've they've won a lot of games. They play an exciting style and brand of basketball, very fast paced, scoring a lot of points, tough defensively. Um, and this game being a pink out, coaches versus cancer, uh, students were back in session. Um, granted, I'm glad we have 4,100. You know, when you look across the landscape of college basketball, there's a lot of teams that wish they had that many consistently, and we have that many consistently. Um, but I'm just greedy i want more so i'm going to give the fans a b i want i want five i want six i want sell out type of crowds uh in diddle arena make it great again bring back that diddle magic when it's full capacity so i'm gonna go with the b um it still was a good crowd um, but i want to take it to a great crowd uh what about your overall grade for this win all right so the hilltopper scored a season high 105 beating previous record of 101 points scored against campbellsville and you know, still having a perfect record at home, which is nine and zero, never hurts. Um, so I'm just going. I'm, I'm going to give overall an A, an A on this game. Yeah, I'm. I'm again. I'm with you. Um, great game, great environment, great win, um, great cause. You mentioned earlier we raised forty two hundred dollars for the American Cancer Society. Um, I think it was a real great event. Um, that focus for that. Um, by Steve Lutz was was amazing to see. You know, pushed it a lot on social media. You can see it meant a lot to him and to the staff, to the players and the community. Really rallied behind that, raised a lot of money for a good cause. And I hope that sticks around and becomes a staple for many, many years to come. Now with that, we turn our attention to this week's upcoming games. And first, we host Sam Houston. They are visiting Diddle Arena this Thursday, February 1st at 8 p.m. The game will be on CBS Sports Network. WKU enters the game with a record of 14-6. and six. We're 3-3 three and three in Conference USA play, while Sam Houston is 12-9 and nine overall and 5-1 and one in Conference USA play. This is a rematch. Uh, we played earlier this month. We played on the 10th of January at Sam Houston uh, with them getting that win 78-74. The ESPN Power Index really likes WKU to win this game and get some revenge. We've got a 70.3% chance of winning. Tyler, what do you think about it? How does this look to you? Well, like you said, re, uh, revenge. Uh, they're sitting at the top of the conference uh, leaderboard right now, and uh, you know it's time they get knocked off their high horse. Um, uh, you know, we, we what we learned from last game is if we would have got to the free throw line more, we would have won that game. You know, turnovers, even um, assist, see 14 16. Uh, really, you just got to look out for uh, Boykins and I think Wilkins, uh, Wilkinson. Um, you know, they they're their leading scorers right now, so you definitely got key in on them. Um, and I, I think we can easily win this game. You know, we're going to have the, the home crowd this time. When it, it, you know, I think it was last uh, last episode. You, you said um, 75% of all home teams win uh, their games. Uh, and I think it's time that, you know, Sam Houston learn what a game inside Diddle feels and sounds like. And I don't think it's going to be anything compared to their home crowd. So I think this is going to be a good game. Uh, and a, definitely a game that we can easily win. We just got to come ready to play. Yeah, in our previous matchup, um, we were out-rebounded by Sam Houston, which is you know one of the only games this year we have been out-rebounded. Then, like you said, we allowed them to get to the free throw line uh, more than we did. Um, they made more free throws than we attempted. I, if I recall correctly, after that game, we talked about 
um, our defense learning how to guard without fouling. You know, being aggressive and intense, but not fouling. You know, just having a shutdown possession, getting the ball back, because um, that free throw disparity ultimately led to the difference in the game. You know, our stats across the board from field goal percentage, uh, rebounds, turnovers, everything else, everything else was almost even until you looked at the free throws. I think we were 8 of 12, and they were 14 out of 20. And that's your ball game, quite frankly. Uh, Sam Houston State is led in scoring by Lamar Wilkerson. He is averaging 15 points per game, and he had 21 in our earlier matchup this year. Their leading rebounder is Damon Nicholas Jr. He's averaging 5.9 rebounds per game, and their leading passer is point guard Jaden Ray, who's averaging four assists per game. Now, Sam Houston State is averaging 71.5 points per game, while we give up 75.1. They allow 71 points per game while we're scoring 80.6 points per game. And then we shoot better than them by nearly 6%, and we out-rebound them on average, though we didn't on the last game. So, Tyler, let's jump into some keys to victory to get some revenge on this Sam Houston State team. What's your first key to victory? Well, my first one's going to be win the rebounding battle. You know, like you, like you mentioned, we lost 40-34, which just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Uh, so I think we definitely got to win that this game. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep beating the drum of the turnovers. I think, um, you know, for a home game, I think we're going to be more efficient on the offensive end. You know, it seems like, you know, once the crowd gets behind us and that offense gets rolling, you know, us shooting 50 and 60%, you know, we're, if we're making good, smart shots, good passes, sharing the ball, Um, we're going to score some points. You know, this offense has proven they can be efficient, but when we turn the ball over, you know, north of 15, 16 times, that makes it hard. You know, you're really fighting against yourself. Um, So it's going to be turnovers for me until we get better in that area. What's your second key to victory? Uh, Defend against Wilkerson and Boykins. Uh, You know, they did hurt us last game, and I think we need to make them feel uncomfortable and to feel the noise and the hostility of our fans. And my second one's going to be something we said after the last game, and I mentioned it earlier, it's going to be guard without fouling. I mean, we can't uh, get ourselves in foul trouble. We can't put them on the free throw line, let them have 20-plus free throw attempts. You know, I feel like every game we've talked about we've lost – free throw disparity has been one of those items that is a a key indicator of what happened. Um, You know, we're getting out rebounded and we're getting out shot at the free throw line. So we've got a guard without fouling. We've shown we can do that. Uh, And when we do do that, it makes us uh, have a better opportunity to win. So guard without fouling. What's your third key to victory? Well, I originally had, you know, play our pace of game, but I changed it whenever you was talking just a little bit ago, and mine's going to be be aggressive, get to the free throw line. Um, you know, only shooting 12 last game against them. Uh, we definitely need to shoot more free throws because sometimes that can be, you know, the difference in a game, winning and losing. And uh, I don't like being on the on the, uh, uh, on the the loser of that, of that number. I definitely don't like the other team shooting more, making more than we even attempt. So definitely get to the free throw line a lot, a lot more. I think we need to focus in on Lamar Wilkerson, kind of similar to how we did uh, Kiki Tandy when we played Jacksonville State. You know, he's kind of their the head of their snake, the guy that's going to be taking the, the bulk of their shots. I'm not saying we're going to slow him down. He's going to score less than his average of 15 or less than 21 that he had last game for us. Uh, but similar to what Tandy had to do, he had to work for every single shot and every single point that he made, uh, which he ended up scoring – you know, north of 25, I believe, but he took a lot of shots to get there. Um, And by the end of the game, he was missing free throws, likely due to tired legs. So make him work on both ends of the court. Uh, You know, if anybody's going to beat you, it's going to have to be him. Um, But just make his life difficult. Who's going to be your MVT versus Sam Houston State? And I, uh, well, I'm I'm going to put in a little little star down there real quick. And uh, I think... Last game, Ken Scroggins hit a few threes against us. Definitely got to keep an eye on him as well. My MVT, um, you know, no surprise. He's coming off a huge game, uh, scoring 30 points. Uh, He can probably feel like he can take on hell with a squirt gun. So I'm going to ride with Dante Allen as my MVT. I'm throwing a curveball here. I'm going away from the point guard. I'm going away from Don McHenry. 
I like him. No love lost there, Don. You're still my boy. But I'm going to look at Christian Lander. He's coming back from concussion protocol, which has been, you know, coaches press conference this week. You know, he was uh, tracking, trending to play this game. So assuming he comes back and he's healthy, he's missed a few games now. Um, he's a very key piece of our defense, you know, slowing the other team's leading scores down. Um, and he's shown that he can get hot offensively too. And, you know, kind of pick, take over and pick up that scoring slack. Uh, he can be a, a secondary ball handler for us. Um, I just think there's a lot of things that he can do and he, he adds to the ball game and it's going to be nice to have him back. And I think, you know, there's going to be a little bit of hunger that he has, you know, coming back. Um, Last game versus Sam Houston, he had a pretty quiet game. I think he only had six points. So, you know, the a couple variables and factors there, if he's been out for a little bit, didn't have a great game against him last time, um, I think he's going to be ready to put on a show and have a good game. What is your score prediction versus Sam Houston? Uh, I have <clears throat> I have us beating them 80 to 68. I feel like uh, teams won't come hungry, going to improve themselves prove that they are the better team, I think they're going to drop the hammer on 80-68. Dang. You got, you got a nice little blow out there. I like that. That would be a comfortable win. Um, I'm going a little bit higher on both teams. I'm going 82 for the Hilltoppers and 76 for Sam Houston. Um, you know, that's us more than our average, and that's us giving up about what we give up on average. But still a comfortable six-point win, so I will take it. Tops win, you win. We are lit, baby. So now we turn our attention over to our Saturday matchup, and that is us renewing the 100 Miles of Hate basketball rivalry with Middle Tennessee State University. Personally, I think that's probably one of the best uh, rivalry nicknames in all of uh, college sports, basketball, football. Um, you know, that rivalry stretches back decades um, it spans multiple sports conferences, um, coaches, players. You know, it's we're so close to each other. We're recruiting from the same grounds. Um, these players know each other. It's just always an intense battle. And I think when these two teams are good, it's so much better for the conference. You know, some of the best home atmospheres and even road atmospheres I've been a part of have been these two teams either playing at Ditto or playing at the Glass House. Um, because they travel really well when, when the teams are good, when they're not good, it, you know, there's not going to be a lot of blue in there, I'm afraid. But um, when these teams are good, it's intense. Now this game is going to be on Saturday. It is at 7 PM and the game will be on ESPN plus and ESPN U. MTSU is currently at eight and 13 on the season. They are two and four in conference USA play. And again, the ESPN Power Index really likes WK to win this game with a 77.4% chance to win. Um, you know, just looking at the record, you know, 8-13, and 13, you know, it, it does appear to be a down year for MTSU this year, but they're still coming off back-to-back -back wins versus Jacksonville State and FIU. Um, you know, and this is just one of those matchups that, you know, you can just throw the records away. You know, it's going to be a slugfest. It's going to be a tough battle. So, Tyler, how does this – rivalry game look and feel to you uh well you know rivalry like i said throw everything out the window uh which player on their team is uh actually giddy pots because i know he ain't never graduated he's still there somewhere hiding in the locker room taking the little bunny classes or whatever or reggie upshaw um I, I i feel like they were there for 10 plus years um but no i to me, this feels like this is going to be an easy victory. Um, you know, you look back on the history with MTSU uh, since 1998, the record is our record against them is 18 and 17. Home record is eight and seven. Uh, largest margin of victory was 80 to 48. And our smallest margin of victory at home was 63 to 61 with the average points being 68. You know, you look at some of their notable games. They won versus Northern Kentucky, 74-57. Win versus Milligan, 88-62. Loss versus Western Carolina, 66-64. Loss versus Belmont, 75-65. Uh, loss versus St. Mary's, 71-34. Uh, to Believe it or not, 34. 
uh, lost to Southern Utah, 69 to 63, and lost at Murray State, 75 to 54. Um, you know, I, I'm looking over some of the points that the, the number of points we score, number of points they score, points against. Um, I just feel like we should definitely blow this team out the water. Uh, McDermott, he may he may have a really really down year, and I know. Uh, I know some of these games they shouldn't be blow they they should be blowouts and they're just tongue tosser nail biters whatever you want to call them. Um, I really hope this ain't one of them um, because I'm I'm go- I'm going to call this one a blowout by for the tops. Yeah, it's it's been a down season for MTSU. I don't think that's uh, you know I think that's safe to say. I don't think that's going out on a limb to say they've had a rough year. They're eight and thirteen. Um, I did have a chance to sit down with uh, an MTSU podcast, the Blue Raider podcast, and Jake Bolden earlier this week and kind of preview our matchup from the MTSU perspective. They got to ask some questions uh, about us, about our team, and what to expect. So got a little bit of a glimpse and gave them a little bit of a glimpse of our team, but I think we were kind of both in agreement that, you know, the one, it's hard to win on the road. Um, and Nick McDevitt, their, their coach now, has – He's really struggled on the road. They've not won a lot. Um, you highlighted some of their offensive woes. Um, again, they are coming off back-to-back wins. Um, they did just beat Jacksonville State and FIU. You know, looking at their conference record, you know, I just looked at their last five. They, they lost to basically the same teams we've lost to, and they beat the same teams that we beat. So um, different margins, obviously, there. And obviously, there's not, um, you know, apples to apples, you know, when, you know, just because you beat them doesn't mean we're going to beat them. But uh, just interesting when you start comparing, you know, similar foes that we've played. Um, but they are led by their leading scorer is Justin Porter. He's averaging 13 points per game. Uh, you mentioned Elias King earlier, also in that 13 points per game average. Uh, their leading rebounder is Jared Coleman-Jones. He's averaging 7.1 rebounds per game. And he's also their leading assist man So with two assists per game. Uh, MTSU as a team is averaging 63.8 points per game, while WKU is, again, giving up 75.1. MTSU is allowing 66.3, so they're giving up more points than they're scoring, uh, while we're scoring 80.6. So, you know, all the stats just kind of point to um, a game that we should win handily. Like you said, it's a home game for us, road game for them. They struggle on the road. We're 9-0 at home. Um, we shoot better than them, we out rebound them, we score more than them. Um, it it should be an interesting game, that's for sure. I know it's a it is a rivalry game. You know, a lot of times you can throw all those stats and statistics and figures and what's supposed to happen out the door. Um, but if the teams come out and, and perform how they have been performing, if WKU plays how they can play or how they just played against FIU, it could get ugly. You know, possibly. Um, but we also know that if we aren't sharp offensively, if we're turning the ball over a lot, um, if we're not guarding without fouling, um, if we're giving up a lot of three pointers, that hey, you know, an upset can happen. A team can come in and beat you if you're not on your best game. So it's going to be a good one. Um, let's jump into some keys to victory. What is your first key to victory in the 100 miles of hate versus MTSU? Uh, don't let MTSU get hot from the field. Uh, like I said, this is a rivalry game and they definitely want to shut our crowd up so we don't get in their heads. Uh, you know, Hilltoppers can't allow that to happen. Can't, can't allow them to do that. So, uh, definitely play smothering defense on them. You know, and getting to talk with Jake, um, you know, he definitely noticed and highlighted our fast pace of play and stated that MTSU was more of a a slower pace of play, half-court offense sets. Um, So that's going to be my my first key is that, you know, they're going to set up their offense and run sets, you know, design plays, and we have to guard without fouling. You know, we have to uh, let a play develop, stay in front of it, you know, help defense as needed, um, and just not foul. You know, sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, in a fast running gun style play where shots are going up, you know, 10 seconds into the shot clock, you know, you're just trying to get a hand up and, and make it a tough shot. But in a half court set, you know, it puts a little bit more pressure on you. They might be going uh, down deeper into the shot clock. And again, that's going to 
increase the chances of either somebody getting open or somebody getting fouled. So we have to guard without fouling by first key to victory. What's your second key to victory? Uh, limit turnovers. Uh, we've had a, a butt ton in, uh, in the last few games, and it'd actually be nice to win the turnover battle for, you know, once in a, in, in a blue moon. I'm right there with you. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to chime in with what Jake shared uh, when I talked with him on the Blue Raider podcast. Um, we turn the ball over a lot, but so do they. Um, so, you know, I just think we need to be, we need to take care of the ball. You know, we need to value the possessions more, um, try to keep that number down under 15. That, you know, that's really kind of a, a, a high benchmark for me. It, it should be well below that in my opinion, but I think 15 is, more than doable, um, but we also need to force MTSU if they have a penchant for turning the ball over, and we're we're pretty tough defensively. You know, we um, have defended well this year. If we can do that and force some turnovers with our fast pace of play, it's going to turn right into offense. So I think we need to win that turnover battle. What is your third key to victory? Uh, once we get ahead, keep our foot on their throats um, and make them as as uncomfortable as a whore in church. Um, you know, I I don't want them to get a whiff of uh, of a chance to have a comeback, or to uh, at least get on a run. So so definitely keep our foot on their throats. I think we've got to speed them up. I mean, they you know they do play a slower tempo. I mean, they're only scoring sixty three points per game, I think, and giving up sixty five. Um, I think we need to speed them up and make them uncomfortable. You know, I don't think they're used to or or want to get into a, a seventy. 80 plus point ball game you know that's doesn't seem to be what they do you know I don't know a ton about their offensive weapons but if their leading score is around 13 you know they don't have guys that are used to scoring that many points and and trying to keep up with us would might be tough so I'd say speed them up make them uncomfortable like you said if we get a big lead you know this is one you gotta step on their throats you know the blue raiders we don't like them um we want to beat them every single time. If we win one game a year, it's this one for me. I'm circling it every year. Um, I look forward to it. Um, when we make the return trip in February, um, I'll definitely be going down. Uh, I always enjoy going down there, hitting up toots, going to the game, um, and just having a good time, hopefully seeing some victories. Uh, but we know life on the road will be hard when we make that return match. But definitely speed them up, make them uncomfortable, and you know, score more points than them. We win, right? Tyler, who's going to be your MVT versus Middle Tennessee? All right, so with this one, uh, I did him. I chose him a few weeks ago. I'm going to go with Brandon Newman. He can be a tide turner. You know, he he can go. He's averaging uh, 6.3 rebounds per game. Um, you know, he can get three rebounds. He's also kind of turned into a scorer lately, averaging 10.7. Uh, he is starting to find his shot from the three-point line. So I'm going to go with Brandon Newman. I, I'm hoping he has a, uh, a huge game for us. I'm going to go back to Old Faithful. I'm going to go to Don McHenry, the steady hand. Uh, PG1, you know, our leading scorer. Um, you know, I want him to just be that guy that can score from all three levels. He can get to the hole, that mid-range, and he step back and hit some threes. Um, I just want him to be a handful for Middle Tennessee. You know, when I talk about speeding them up, you know, he's the guy that's going to speed him up. You know, it's going to come off his hand um, and his legs, pushing the ball down and, and scoring fast. So give me Don McHenry, lead us to victory, hopefully. Um, what about score prediction versus Middle Tennessee? All right, so I called it a blowout. Um, I've actually changed the score prediction while while we were talking uh, multiple times. I've added just a few to MTSU score. Uh, but the tops win by a score of 95. 261. I originally had them at like 53. I thought, you know, I, I give them a little bit of credit, you know, for garbage time, you know, the, you know, they may score just a little bit, but yeah, 95, 61. It's a good tops by 90. Tops by 90 in Bowling Green. Let's go. Uh, my score is a little closer than yours, but still a very convincing victory. I went with WKU 84 MTSU 69. I think that would be a very nice victory for the Hilltoppers um, to get back in the win column. Yeah, you know, I saw somebody posted. It's been it's been a few years since we beat Middle Tennessee in Bowling Green. So 
Uh, we need to right that ship. Uh, we need to continue getting back, you know, winning in the left-hand column and beating Middle Tennessee um, after beating, hopefully, Sam Houston. is always a good way to do that. So looking forward to these two games. Um, you know, just it's always good to be back at home. Uh, again, 9-0 and at home. That leads itself to believing me believing that, you know, we're more than likely to win. I really like our team at home. Um, we're more inconsistent on the road. I'd like to see us clean that up. We, you know, we have some return matches coming up soon, some games we've lost um, that we've got to, we've got to win when they come back to diddle. So looking forward to every game, but especially these two that we have coming up. Um, hopefully good crowds. I want to see more than 41, 44. I want five. I want six. I want seven thousand plus i want to i want to get a sellout might not happen but you know we're going to keep pushing for it you know i saw steve lutz is buying uh hot dogs and beverages for uh students this thursday you know who knows maybe he'll do something for the saturday mtsu game as well um you know students being back you know we want them energized we want that energy that excitement that that noise um you know that impact that they bring to the game um we need them in diddle we need everybody in diddle. So let's get to the games. Let's support the tops. And let's beat the Blue Raiders. Tyler, give us your final words and take us out of here. Yeah, uh, I definitely hope a, it, it is a sellout, especially for MTSU, because that would be awesome. Um, students, I hope students show up, because that's a great thing that Lutz is doing. You know, hot dog and a beverage. I'm sure some some students uh, want the adult beverage. I don't know if he'll, if he'll spring for that or not. Um, but you know, piss on MTSU. Um, as always, they're garbage. Uh, teams garbage. Uh, college is garbage. Um, been down there and it's just flat. You know, ain't, ain't nothing pretty about it. Kind of like their team this year. Um, uh, but with that, once again, I'll say piss on MTSU and Moth. Who has it better than us? Nobody, buddy. You know Nobody. it. Go tops. Go tops. Later, guys. See you.